Hey, welcome, everyone. Welcome to RevOps Live, where we bring you insights from the top uh, RevOps leaders and data-driven revenue experts. I'm Mike Nee, CMO of OpenPrize, the leader in RevOps data quality, and we're here to explore cutting-edge ops practices among RevOps, shaping the go-to-market strategies the entire customer revenue cycle. You know, we're drawing from inspirations from incredible success, success stories of our customers, our speakers. It's all for you guys. Uh, the data-driven revenue experts and, and ops leaders. And today I'm thrilled to have Lior Spira, um, a true leader in RevOps with us. Lior, it's great to have you here. Can you start by telling us a little bit about, you know, maybe a couple of sentences on just how did you end up in RevOps? Uh, it's so funny, but this morning I got this, I, I was asked the same question I don't know, with someone on LinkedIn. Yeah, it's so funny. Um, so I will say like the the simple and obvious answer would be, by mistake. Um, but if you, yeah, but I think eventually uh, I got into RevOps because I started as marketing uh, back then. I was actually, I studied law and and then I shifted my career. But it makes sense because, you know, as lawyers, we are very strict. We are very processes and data driven, not and in a persnickety. way that... Persnickety exactly. sometimes is a good is a good word. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, and yeah, and and I then I shifted into marketing, and then I found it like a, I, I think I was drawn into operations and like marketing and sales operations uh, before I became uh, RevOps or before I don't know the ecosystem even named it RevOps. But this is how I got there. I I was very uh, intrigued back then. I remember to um, you know. Um, the holistic vision of how to connect one department to the other on how to make sure that you're not just creating communication between people, but also with the data and also with the insights. And I guess, yeah, it just, it was, uh, it was very natural for me to be that uh, person. And also, you know, I, I remember when I was a student, I worked with my dad. He has uh, an accounting uh, firm. And the first thing that I did is build his own like a whole operational um, excellence uh, processes there. So it was, yeah, <laughs> so early. it was, you see, yeah. So it was very, I think, yeah, it was like, I, it's, I think I knew in my heart that I would be an operational leader. I just didn't know that I would be like in like revenue in the dollar, in the business, in understanding marketing sales and customer success. And just bring it all together. You know, this, you're very much looking forward to this conversation because we're actually going to pull some of those learnings from you around just establishing a solid data foundation, you know, maintaining, maintaining the data quality that we've talked about um, and optimizing that, that whole buying journey, um, which is all about getting to that efficiency and even we'll maybe touch upon a little bit about the AI and operational uh, success. But let's get into question number one. You know, the art. You often emphasize the importance of strong data foundation. Uh, why is it so critical? I think you know people all know somewhere in their hearts that it is, but it's sometimes hard for people to put into words. Well, that's a good question. Um, I think companies don't really understand that it's very important to build an operational infrastructure from the beginning. And when I say operational infrastructure, it's not just, you know, having a procurement policy or anything that is related to how the business operates. I think more on the, again, go to market. So if you want to build a company and, you know, move to market fit and then hyper growth and then to a stage of uh, scale and success, right? You need to build the foundation. And again, it's very simple. It's like you're building a building, like you need to build the foundation first and then grow with it um, um, from the ground up, right? So, um, and, and again, most companies, most startups, uh, you know, they want to run fast. They want to have a product. They want to they wanna, uh, earn tons of revenue. They want to bring tons of customers at the beginning. If it's, uh, I don't know, it's... Um, um, free subscription, PLG, any type of model that they want to do, you know, just to have like a list of, of customers or, you know, users, but they don't really understand how important it is to stop for, for just a second, understand like the process, understand your ICP or at least your customer, right? And then make sure that you align with everything else. And you could, and it means like you align it with marketing initiatives. 
you're aligning it with the sales process, POC process if needed, like the onboarding, then customer advocacy, like everything is connected with one another. And it's like, I think sometimes they forget that you cannot do this in like all together at one time without, you know, and just throw everything into your face. You just need to stop for a second and understand exactly how you, de- you take your prospect from one touch point to the other, to the other, to the other. And then, you know, not just creating touch points in customer journey, but also creating like uh, um, significant milestones for, for, again, not for only their success, but for your company's success, for making an impact, right? So, yeah, well, I, I love say, what you're saying. It's sort yeah. of like, one, even as you're growing, don't forget to eat your vegetables. No one wants to eat their vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> but you do That's have to true. make those small investments. And I, I like the second thing you said, which was, you know, make sure you start uh, and you start thinking about your foundations early. Just speaking to a PLG company that is now trying to add a direct sales motion on top of it just because they need the margins. This, this market is shifting quickly. Ops is how they get there. They never made the investments to think about their data a little more holistically. So it became yeah. such its own bespoke stack. And now they really, you know, had to really struggle to get through that. Um, but, you know, that gets to, you know, sort of the common pitfalls. I mean, you've seen companies building up, getting from, you know, as they scale. What are the common pitfalls that companies should avoid when building just their whole data, you know, infrastructure and keep it scalable? Um First, I think companies usually, you know, they focused on the team. They focus on just growing the marketing team, growing the sales team because they bring the revenue. They're growing marketing for brand awareness and for, uh, you know, uh, um, generating MQLs, uh, leads, SQLs, like all the, you know, um, the, the buzzwords that we hear. And then you have tons of customer success hires to treat those customers and make sure that they're not just onboarded, they're also t- being taken care of uh, and such. So, and I think that the, and, and you can see, uh, well, post COVID, I would say, um, and especially I think um, in the past two years, you see like how revenue operations or any type of operational position arise just because Again, the data, if you want to measure yourself and, and measure your success, you need to have the data. If you're going to have, the, if you're going to lie with your data and you're going to manipulate it, that's fine. You can do that. But if you want to actually understand how you're doing and make sure that your company is effective, efficient, uh, productive and doing everything again, not just by the book, you should go by the book or use best practice, but you should also, you know, concentrate on having good data in terms of you can rely and trust it and then make the best decision for the company to succeed. And again, you can ask the CRO to do that or own that. You can ask the CMO to own that. You can ask any C or even the CEO, right? Because they know the product, they know the process. They think that they know also, you know, what the customer or the prospect wants. But eventually, you know, every function at a company has their own expertise and having an operational function that is dedicated to not, again, not just building the process, but also understanding how go to market operates. um, I think this is how you should build the infrastructure of your data, because that way you can actually measure what you're doing and you can make the best decision for each department and for the company on a higher level uh, perspective, you know, and then also then plan your hiring programs, your um, marketing initiatives. And then, you know, you, ju- you know, just spend your money on, I don't know, on um, everything that you think might bring value or uh, revenue growth. So simple as that. Well, and, and it's, you know, it strikes very much close to home. I was, just speaking with a partner over at Storm Ventures. And, you know, we had just gotten off of speaking about mid-enterprise and enterprise customers need to start small and they know that they have to take on their data in pieces. Very much like you were saying, start, make it clean and you can span from there. Storm Ventures is like, look, right away, rather than hiring like a sales admin, we actually hire a RevOps person. Why? Because it's, not, it's one thing to know how Salesforce is working. It's another thing to say the CEO has a view on how his business works. What's the... It's like, well, who's the product manager for his GTM motion? And it's so 
critical to have that piece. That said, you know, let's move on to the next question, which is related. You know, data quality is so critical in RevOps. Uh, and we were talking a little bit about that around customer data management. Can you help us understand uh, why it's so challenging to get to, you know, quality? We hear people talk about it. It's been a struggle. Like what, what, what strategies are, are effective if, if, or against those challenges? I think the most, like the biggest challenge is, you know, when you hire your RevOps or, you know, the expert that you need. For example, I joined companies and, and, and build a team from the ground up uh, in different stages. Here, for example, at Blink, I joined at a very early stage. At first, they wanted to hire like a, maybe marketing operations a manager, maybe sales operation manager, just to be, I think, more focused on um, maybe bringing the CRM or, uh, you know, execute admin tasks um but they were not i think and again with when it comes to processes they thought they or they wanted to bring someone that they can help them um craft um like a specific maybe sales process and make sure like see how uh you implement it in in the crm but eventually they hired me and and again it's not just me they hired revops like uh, with with experience and i think companies what they do and this is and i also advise companies and the reason for that is because comp like startups usually don't think they need um a, an in-house uh revenue operations uh, expert but they also you know they don't want to hire an advisor because the first advisors that they would get would be related to go to market motions like marketing sales or customer success right but they don't really understand how important it is to build like everything like when you build something from scratch the 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 key to success is like simplify the process build something that you can capture the data and then you can scale up together with the processes make the modification you know along the way but you can do that when you build like when you bring the right technology um the right person to to um, orchestrate the integration to orchestrate the process and how each like um um tack would connect with one another, how like you're going to hand over one specific data and information from one department to the other. So it's, it's more of, and again, it's, it's an art, right? And I think the, the biggest challenge is usually it's not a priority. Usually they don't put like budget on having such function in the company and they just, they want to hire. And I had this experience in previous companies as well is, they hired us um, or they bring us to the company after round B, sometimes even C, you know, when they have Salesforce or HubSpot CRM in place, they want to either move to one system to the other. They want to fix everything. They want to, and, and then you need to break everything and you need to clean and you need to chase for the data and, and then you need to train the team. And it's, you know, and then it becomes a mess. And also it becomes like a, like an ongoing data cleanup and a tactical position instead of just, you know, strategic one together with a tactical one to help the company and to help, especially again, go to market leadership and the, the founders to, to lead their ship into their North Star, right? Or to what they want, like to achieve the goals that they set for either this specific uh, quarter, year, or whatever, right? And... Yeah, I think, again, I think companies and startups are changing. Like They understand that this is a big challenge. They're trying to shift away and they, they are trying to, to find uh, and hire RevOps function. But usually I think that the biggest mis mistake, again, they do is bring an admin and just give them, you know, tactical tasks and just, you know, what they want instead of even listen. So... Well, and this yeah. gets back to, you know, ensuring data quality, you know, is, you know, one of the big challenges is really that silos and inconsistent, you know, data across the groups. And to your point, and you wrote about this, you know, how do you move from being tactical to more strategic? And a lot of that gets into sort of you. Um, and so the community, how do you actually learn from each other? Because there's a, both a change management as well as the skills um, that you can pick up along the way as you are starting to elevate. Um, and start bringing in some of those, uh, bring the changes that RevOps often uh, does in terms of leading across the different silos. But, you know, this gets back to 
cross silo. You know, the, you know, the, the question I would ask then is around, you know, we talk sometimes talk about the customer journey. I, I would actually think about it like the buying journey. And 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 it's so crucial for RevOps to really understand this, understand who is a you know expanded buying committee in today's B2B landscape. How how do you leverage data to optimize you know this buying journey? Well, I think first we 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 have AI today, so we have tons of solutions that can help us to do that. And and again, from previous experience, and I have more than fifteen years doing op, like rev ops, sales ops, sales and marketing ops, and such. You know, I, I think I remember in the past we used to build these uh, modules. We need to uh, we had we define the touch points. We keep we kept changing. And fixing the data so it will, you know, um, um, support the assumptions that that we raised um, or we wanted to be proved, right, and not refuted. Uh, and I think now that you have AI, like you need to to leverage technology to help you move faster. And I, I think this way you can also be proactive instead of reactive, right? Because you can learn. When it comes to to maybe product and uh, other departments, you know, sometimes you want to be reactive and not proactive because you need to make sure that everything is stable. But for us, like in in go to market, especially, you should be proactive. And the reason for that, if you keep losing, uh, you know, time from one fiscal quarter to the other, instead of just making decisions on the spot, sometimes when you have the data and you have the tools, so and and this can be uh, not just a game changer, but also life saving or startup saving, you know, um, money and time. Right. And, and, and yeah, so, so what I do is I usually, you know, I, and I, I think like how I operate is I choose or work together with, with leadership um, um, and trying to define like the top five key metrics that we want to chase based on that, you know, we go, then we, we scroll down and we choose like the best tools that we can use. Usually we, we don't have to build everything in place. We can bring something, you know, that can support us, like scoring. Like and, and when it comes to buying committee, which is, I think, the most um, painful process uh, that you can or, or research that you can conduct. And, I, and I'm doing it right now, even a blank is like you need to understand exactly what would be the best uh, buying committee to push the deal, not even to closed one, but at least to a very, very, very significant milestone like POC or a negotiation, something like that. Right. So exactly. So so sometimes it takes so much time and you have so many titles and you have so many. I don't know. Uh, the ecosystem is keep changing. Titles that keep changing. Um, decision makers that keep changing just because, you know, sometimes I, re I remember back then VPs were only the decision maker. Today, you can even have a manager depends on the organization who can be not just the decision maker, but also the budget holder. Right. So it's very dependable. And you, and you just need and there are so many models like you can use for like every like. And again, it's not just you can have an ICP, but it can be you can you can have different buying committee for a specific industry, for a specific region, for a specific, I don't know, anything that you can come up with. And you, you can have like tons of definitions because you have to be focused on winning deals, right? So you need to leverage the data by using the, the right tool instead of just bringing so many things in-house and then just, I think, move forward, move, uh, it's not forward, it's like move move away from from your end end goal right and we and know sales guys always capture everyone who is at every meeting we know that they, exactly they, they capture salesforce is just such a load of great data from the sales guys yeah exactly actually, just getting pragmatic one level uh in terms of just a how-to for some of the folks on you know listening how can you know a revops leader ensure that you know the teams and and basically the data wraps that capture and process around the buying committee? Is there like one or two stories where they, like, hey, this is pragmatically how we had to do it at this company? Again, um, you have best practice, right? You can use it, but I think it's very different from one company to the other. Like usually the basic would be, you know, the process, but um, yeah, you have to be 
open-minded. And, and I think usually what happens is sales leaders, you know, sometimes they don't think about the, the best buying committee. The like um, founders, they don't want to focus on the best buying committee. They see the champion or like the VP C-level role that usually is the the DM and they chase him. And this is how they instruct, um, um, you know, the reps to do. Um, And also, I think even when it comes to SDR, we don't have in a, have, uh, um, spray and pray campaigns methodologies anymore. It's like more personalization, more like focused personas. And you need to make sure that you are not just you know, um, bombarding them with, with messages, with emails, with calls, with everything. Like you have to find the right time at the right um, platform with the right messaging that, that you're doing. And, and again, it's, it's relevant for every function in the customer journey process, um, not just the buyer process, because this is how you create aw- awareness, right? And it's very, very critical that you, you be on top of that and you have to well define it. And again, and this is why you have data. And if you build the infrastructure from the beginning, in the, in the right way, or at least in a scalable way. And then you leverage the data along the process to, to bring you to even choose the right tool or the one that might give you the visibility or the, the type of analysis that you're looking for to gain or to get like what you need on how to define ICP at, or the buying committee, then it's just, it's easy, right? It's oh, absolutely. And and you're you're hinting at a little bit of I think what we talked about earlier, which is, you know, the buying cycle is uh, you know not just from opportunity to close. We really talk about how does marketing engage that we are teeing up and starting to educate others in the buying committee that the sales folks are not going to engage with because we know that's absolutely the case. Um, and how do you grow? I was just working with a CRO, and his big pain point was he's now owning the customer, you know, sort of like a customer account management again. And, and we're seeing that more and more as a big frustration where growth has become more important than just your booking, uh, you know, cl- new bookings. And how do you grow with the customers? And CRO is having to learn a new muscle and therefore have the data to think about the full journey of, of buying and continuing to buy. And I think that's what's important. And that's where crossing these silos and starting to think about what data actually tells us and how do we make sure that the teams are aligned around a shared set of data uh, to your point, is, is so important in terms of creating that integration. Um, but that, you know, that's, that gets a little bit down to, you know, integration to an alignment of teams. You know, breaking down silos is a common challenge um, as you rethink this buying process. Uh, what strategies have you found effective in integrating and aligning sales, marketing, and customer success? Um, so, again, as you mentioned, I think companies and CROs, um, Mainly, you know, they're shifting from uh, new business, new logos, deals to land and expand. And this is how you break the silos. Like you need to understand that you you don't just need to win deals. You need to land and expand. You need to you need to um, win the customer, make an impact, then move towards like growing the account, um, growing the LTV, right? Uh, making sure that they're not because eventually they are becoming your advocates. And this is how, and, and when you choose the right methodology, you, for example, I, cho- I used to work with uh, sales leaders uh, following uh, Medic, Medbig, Bunt, you know, all the, the um, I guess, all the buzzwords, yes. But now when you have Spice, you have the bow tie, you have, like, you understand that, Everyone is connected in the process of um, of, uh, of of the the customer journey, right? Then um, it allows you to not just break the silos. You understand the friction, and you can bring a solution to the table so fast. Then you you're again, and and it's not just the data, like the tactical, um, let's say approach. It also gives you like it helps strategically. Uh, the departments to work with one another or invite them to a discussion, like, for example, you know, customer success, uh, starting to work more closely with marketing, 
because now they have references or citations from customers that can help, you know, not just marketing to raise awareness for the brand, but also it can help the, the sales team, you know, to bring more like or bring similar logos or similar deals, win them and expand them as well. It's like everyone working together well in i want to say harmony but you know it's like uh, it's, it's too, <laughs> it's too good to be true we all know what the but we can wish be. we can wish. we get their 10 percent, 20 percent. i think we're gonna call that a win today <laughs> <laughs> that's true that's true that's true but yeah but i think and this is and, and this is how you call like, i i remember that i i um read in um in in one of gardner if i'm not mistaken or deloitte uh um article that they say like it's once upon a time it was the CEO who orchestrated like the company, right? And then it became, and then um, the RevOps took this place not because they took the CEO place, it's because they took this responsibility to orchestrate the go-to-market, to orchestrate all the departments who are having re- a relationship with um with the customer and again it can be from the beginning like marketing and sales when there are prospects to when they are almost becoming like committed to to the sale and then they when they become a paying customer so it's just yeah it's an art it's like it's like music to your ears right so when you're playing this role and i sometimes when i speak to RevOps leaders i say you're the product manager of the revenue engine why because you may be the smartest person in the room, but you never want to be that when you're putting people, bringing people together. They want to know that they've been heard. They are now starting to speak the same language and they're now working towards more of a common goal and you've helped break them from their silos. You know, how do you ensure when you go in that the teams are aligned and speaking the same language? Is there a place that you typically are starting? Is there, you know, how do you build up a little bit of that common understanding upon which you can start now revving up a more shared view on the, on the full cycle? So to, first, you build a trust, right? You build a trust with the teams uh, because this is how you maintain a communication. And again, we're not the smartest people in the room, just so you know. You could be, well, but you don't, certainly don't we, want no, to come across we, that way. No, <laughs> we could be. The, no, the reason that I'm saying it is because we are reading the data. Like, we are speaking with facts. And how we do that, we, we, we earn the trust by building the process and making sure that we hear the end users. We are documenting what we have or what we're doing or what we're implementing. And also, and I think how I operate is I'm building my own buying committee internally. Um, I never operate by myself. My end users are my customers. If I want to succeed, I need them to succeed. So, and again, it's not a success with closing an opportunity or um, um, upselling an existing customer. Of course it is, but also if they, but if they use the system and they, they are, um, I remember, I think a few weeks ago, one of the, the AEs, uh, during a pipeline review, um, a meeting that we had, he, he texted me and said, like, the OR is using Excel and not Salesforce. What we're losing data. And I'm like, Oh my God, this is the, you see, and this is how you succeed because First, they want to be your champion. They want to, they want to work with you. They also want to, they also help you. They are your allies. Eventually, you need people, you know, internally to support again, not just the process, not just the buzzword, but also to actually have the data. So, and when they, if I care, it's fine. But if they care, it just, this is, this is a win win situation. Yeah. And they see how their, their specific data, because everyone are professionals. Marketing is professionals. You're a digital marketing person. They know their data. They don't often see it in context. And when they understand how everyone's contributing, if you can build that trust, which is listening, showing them data and helping bring it into context and creating a shared context, I think is so important. And that effective integration alignment really hinges on that seamless communication, but also underneath it, the data and the technology uh, that's helping you pipe all this data, even if it's Excel or Google Docs, whatever it is. But that communal data and shared processes certainly foster a unified approach to revenue uh, operations. So let's get back to something that you can't get out of a conversation without hitting, which is AI and efficiency in RevOps. You know, it, you know, whether it's around, you know, getting your data GTM ready or just actually getting your data ready for AI. Um, there are plenty of dedicated discussions going around this. So I'm, I'm asking, asking you a top five use cases where AI is impacting RevOps. Just, you know, just off the top of your mind and then we'll, we'll break from there. 
Okay, so first I can say, and I'm using it right now, is like forecasting, right? Uh, I don't think you um, you need to use or you need to ha- even hire a, um, a data analyst and uh, bring BI to to create like um, or build in depth uh, forecast analysis. You can either use what you have in your CRM and you can also bring a tool with an AI, which I'm using right now, um, Roblox, for example, but that you can by, by, by a click or, you know, with two clicks and sometimes even a month, you can just design your dashboard and then you can see not just um, your baseline. You can also see um, how the baseline, you know, correlate, uh, correlates, sorry, with um um, with your uh, um, plan goal. And you can also see uh, not just forecast, but also projection and prediction because the AI based on the behavior that mm-hmm. that it, um, um, you know, that your silly, data has provided uh, it. <laughs> and it's, and, and again, no, and it's, right, the data, but also how the users use the system, right? And how they how they move, like they, they operate in the process it teaches the AI and gives me insights like on the spot on, you know, how like based on this behavior, if you're going to hit the target or not. And if not, OK, what we need to do right now to fix it. Another thing is um, we're all used to, as I mentioned before, like um, um, spray and pray, right? Create campaigns, bring tools to build sequences. To and cadences with different in different platforms and no now it's more personalization and AI helps you to do that with either understanding the intent by how the prospect the lead operates in social media or other platforms um, you know when it comes uh, um, to to your either product industry or even ICP and then it gives you more um, or not just information, but also help you leverage their actions or the touch points into a message using AI, right? Like, uh, and, and we are doing that even right now. We're testing it. Of course, you need to train the AI, but it gives you, you know, more visibility and transparency on your or, uh, with your prospect instead of going to very heavy technology and tools that require you to build, like to, to invest six months at least just to build the process or the, the infrastructure. And, and you oh, we see really how that, that deep segmentation and building, you know, hundreds of course, plus nurtures for each crack. Personalization, exactly. certainly uh, for marketing, uh, changing uh, just how you connect. Although for sales, exactly. I would say that it's interesting. It's probably better for research than communication. We've certainly heard a lot of horror stories of breaking yeah. relationships with laying uh, what people expect of a more one-to-one with SDRs and AEs. I think it's, uh, I think so. it's a work in progress. In security, yeah. for example, in our industry, you see that it works. It works because tech, like engineers, they don't like having conversation. They want to hear the solution. Like they want to hear how, how you're going like to impact them. like some of the RevOps and marketing ops people I know. That's true. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> but you see, so you do that. Again, the same with, with scoring. You have tons, not tons, you have some very good uh, scoring tools that help you, you know, um, use AI and understand like your buyer journey, customer journey throughout, like, like end to end, um, um, throughout the, their way or how they interact with your, your product. And then you don't have to build like, um, formulas or you have to work with, with BI to understand exactly the behavior and then, craft some kind of scoring and then fix it all, like you know over the time because you have new data and you need to you need to adjust it just give you it gives you um like a transparent or or a mirror to what is happening like in, on the spot um and i think uh, and again i think eventually it's not just a superpower for us for revops to bring the solution or to bring the, the the data and transparency into the table it just it also gives a superpower to the reps and again it can be marketing sales and even customer success when it comes to to support and and tools that helps with ai to to provide solutions or answers immediately to a ticket for example instead of just wasting tons of time tons of of research Tons of, I don't know, resources, you know, even when I say even resources, it's like hiring large 
team of SDRs and, and sales reps, you know, and dividing them to enterprise, mid-market, uh, et cetera, like you can, you can utilize AI in so many ways to improve your own motions internally. Well, I, I love what you're saying. And whether I call it a superpower or whether I'd call it a power up, there's two different things. I actually think what's interesting is to make AI work, you have to actually operationalize it. it you know, yes, it's embedded in some products and you know, revenue intelligence, you're hinting at some of those pieces for forecasting, it's embedded in their processes. But in general, to use AI, it has to be associated with some automation, some process. And this is actually a great way for ops to actually get in front of this change, to leverage it and help drive and lead that change across the organization. And then actually underneath that, understand increasingly what data it needs to feed that. Um, and so many of these tools you know, may pull their own data, but they're not very good at sharing it. So ops has to think about how do I actually stage data in a way that now, not only am I preparing the data, but I can use it in other places, and then I can feed these different AI engines. And so it's a really important question and a great power-up and a forcing function to kind of be a wedge for ops people to elevate themselves. So I do recommend people to take that opportunity. Uh, and, and even delved into a little bit into have to have AI and RevOps. Your your insights have been invaluable. Um, any, you know, any last words, uh, Lior, and something we may have missed? I think um, if you want to be a great RevOps, uh, you have to learn to say no, and you have to trust your instinct and, and gut feeling because m most of the time since we leave the data, we live and breathe even the data, like we can forecast uh, 10 steps ahead and, and we will know what is going to do good or not. And we can even, uh, you know, communicate it to either leadership or, or the teams. And, and again, and even when you asked me about, you know, overrated and underrated, like I think everything works now. You just need to make sure that you understand exactly how to use whatever tool or vendor or um, any type of technology um, in place and and use it smart in, in, in a smart way. Like invest in what matters, measure what matters. And if companies or if um, um, your managers and founders are pushing you to do things that you don't think you should do, Again, you don't have to agree. You can present, a, 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 no, you can present a different solution. This is this is what I do, by the way. And then after six months, I prove that they were wrong. So it's not that I, I don't want to get, I don't want to, and again, I don't want to. in their thinking. We don't use the W word here. Ex exactly. And, 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 and this is what I say. And I also prove them that I was right. And not because I was right because I'm a smart person, because I use the data, I leverage the data. So if you're a wrap up, um, use the data, leverage it, and try to, I don't know, create a picture or explain yourself in a way that would prove, you know, the point that you want to make and bring to the table. This is how I, you I love strategic. how you're wrapping this up. I mean, number one, it's about the data. It is your foundation. It is your base of power. Number two, yeah. say no. And that is actually more important than people think. Because you have to make space from being a service desk. We see so many ops teams starting at a point where they're just buried and they're never going to yeah. catch up to that, all the number of things they have to do. Saying no builds on that other thing you've talked about right from the beginning. You have to have that trust or else you're not going to have um, those who are in power be able to give you the breathing room so you can get in front to help plan, to actually help pull, not just give them the data they ask for, but to give them the data they need, right? And to start thinking about those processes. So, you know, Lior, thank you for joining us. Um, where can they connect with you, Lior? Um, the, you know, LinkedIn. You know, just to make sure LinkedIn. they stay in touch. All right. Yeah, I LinkedIn is the best. you're publishing, and so that's a great place to see your articles <laughs> and your thoughts. Yeah, so LinkedIn is the best place to do, to connect with me. Um, I also have a blog, but it's written in my profile. So, so you can go and I, I share tons of ideas and um, posts on LinkedIn. Yeah, I think this, this is uh, the best way. And you can even send a message or anything that you feel like you want to talk about. So, Well, and you yeah. share so much and you helped create the community out there around RevOps and they're just bringing all the ideas together. I certainly recommend anyone 
who is still on their journey, and that's where many of us are as this early market around RevOps is growing, to follow your, continue to share uh, and uh, continue to learn. And I think this is, an, this, is just a, this is going to be a fun journey. Thank you, Lior, for joining us and sharing <laughs> your expertise. It's actually been a pleasure. Thank you so much. It's been right. a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.